So hello, everybody, and welcome back. Well, how fantastic to hear from Dmitry Kaminsky of Deep Knowledge Ventures about longevity, investment and scientific progress in that area. From Professor Sarah Bridal, from a member of an extragalactic astronomy and cosmology research group to address that challenge of reducing greenhouse emissions. And from Dr. Matthias Evers from McKinsey talking about that cross-cutting potential of biotechnology. So it's a real pleasure to bring you live such a diverse panel in terms of experience, in terms of visions of the future, and to bring your questions to them. So the first thing that I'd like to pick up is, I wonder if there is a tension emerging from the themes that we've talked about in terms of that ability to improve health, to improve livelihoods, to improve even lifespan, but also looking at the burden that we as a human um, race put on the planet. I wonder if you could please address for us whether those two things um, our intention with each other and whether there is um, a space of progress here. Who shall start? Let's, Dmitry, if I can please address this to you to begin with. Thank you. Yes. So there is such kind of myth that if people will live longer and if there will be more people on the planet, you know, uh, there will be shortage of food and, you know, some other issues. In reality, this is not the point that <clears throat> we're absolutely sure that a uh, planet can accommodate uh, maybe 20, maybe even 30 billions of people. And it's not, uh, it's what, not the point of quantity of people on the planet. It's uh, uh, the issue with technologies, how inefficient are current technologies, which are, you know, we are uh, producing a lot of pollution, a lot of uh, toxins and different uh, other uh, problems for the planet and for society. On the other hand, new emerging technologies, including, you know, biochemistry technologies capable to neutralize those uh, uh, issues, uh, plus to that maybe even progress in nanotechnologies. Uh, and, you know, there are some uh, progress with uh, bacteria capable to neutralize uh, some pollutions, some uh, chemical uh, toxins. So the, <clears throat> I think that in the next five to 10 years, uh, most of those uh, problems will be capable to uh, be solved by progress in technologies. And with that, uh, there will be no problem, you know, of this uh, quantity of growing uh, quantity of people on the earth. Thank you. And I think just as a shout out to another Cambridge alumnus, I think actually Malthus several centuries ago actually talked about the problems of population growth and burdens on, on, the, on the planet. Um, we're a long way on from that, but I wonder where we're looking now from your position, Sarah, if you could please give us some insights there. Yes, I mean, certainly if you look at greenhouse gas emissions um, as, as, as a function of time and you look at population as a function of time, then they, the gra graphs do look very similar. And certainly, you know, if people continue to have the lifestyle they have now, um, then the more people there are, then, then we, we, we can't, we're, not, we're not on track anyway. And certainly if we have more people, it, it would make it worse if those people were living in the same way. But I, I agree with what Dimitri has said, that if we, if we were to change the way that we live, um, then, then, then we could accommodate more people. Um, but we'd have to make some quite drastic changes, um, including to our diets, in order to make that possible. And Matthias, I wonder if I can ask you, given those breadth of technologies that you've spoken about, how we will have access to them, what's the likelihood of them achieving that success that Sarah and Dimitri have um, laid out? Yeah, let, let me uh, first comment also on, on the challenge, because I would tackle this question. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of literature, a lot of academics have been thinking about aging populations, the implications. I think I mean, let, let's let's uh, tackle that problem from the right side. We are growth species. Every person has a right for a healthy, long life, and innovation is required to make that happen. So I think that's the, the direction I, I would look at that. So are there problems to solve? Absolutely. So, I, but I would just give it this forward, perhaps slightly optimistic, but forward-looking view. Now, I would make the case, given our research, and that's why we call it essentially the biorevolution, that biology, biology but also the collaboration and confluence with other technologies, particularly computing, analytics, AI, is required to solve some of these problems. And I mean, as one example, how, I mean, and Sarah just mentioned it, how does our, our nutrition look like? What's the sustainable nutrition? I think maybe last point from my side before I stop, I mean, we made an estimate that uh, let alone, I mean, using these technologies can cut greenhouse gas emissions by seven to 9%. I don't believe that's a fairly aggressive estimate. 
if we would utilize more of these technologies. But I would make the call out that innovation is required in light of these challenges. Thank you. And I think that actually walks us on to another question posed by one of our leaders of tomorrow very nicely. I wonder, Sarah, if you could please give us some information on what potential there is for cleaner solutions for food production. Um, we've had um, allusions earlier on the summit to technologies such as cell cultured meat products. And one other point here is just to look at if there's a tension between the farmers and the scientists here. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there's lots of different things that we can do um, in food production to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, I mean, all the way from uh, methane inhibitors that we could feed, uh, add to the feed of, of ruminants like cows, um, things we can do to improve, improve soil health so that and soils will then hold on to the nutrients more um, and, and so less nutrients would need to be applied. And one of those is, is called biochar, which you may have heard of, where um, you put um, carbon you could even you can even um, take, have carbon that comes from trees and then and then you, you char that and then you put it in the soil. That's an example of a kind of intervention that can reduce the need for nutrients and also lock up carbon. Um, precision agriculture applying uh, nutrients as needed rather than a blanket kind of approach. Um, and then new sources of animal feed, um, which maybe, you know, links us on to, to some of the other things that maybe you could do in a lab. I mean, growing duckweed uh, can, can be done in vats, uh, even in the desert, as long as you've got something uh, that can contain water that's sealed, uh, you can grow duckweed. And that's a fantastic uh, source of animal food that doesn't require deforestation, for example. Um, but to, to, to lab meat, um, certainly at the moment it requires a lot of inputs, um, but there's no technical reason why that shouldn't come, keep coming down. And certainly in terms of energy inputs, if it was renewable energy that's being used, then that can come down. But of course, we actually already do have uh, cultured uh, food, uh, something like myco protein, um, corn, uh, as it's sold in the UK. Um, and so some of these things already exist and, and there's certainly of, of actual animal cell culture but in terms of tensions with uh, farmers I mean any kind of change uh, causes tension and um, obviously in any kind of change then you want to be involving all the stakeholders um, in deciding what that change is and also compensating some of the people who are, who are, who are, who are disadvantaged by a change there's nothing new about any of that that's specific to food um, so we need to def definitely give uh, farmers a voice and support in all of this um, but in any case, we are going to have to change our food system. Um, whether we have we have lab meat or not, for example, we do need you know we do need to reduce the amount of meat that's being produced uh, rather than increase it, which is what's currently happening. Thank you. So some considerations for us when we return to in-person gap summits. A question targeted directly at um, some of the points from Dimitri. One of our LOTs is. Um, it, talking about the predictions that potentially the first human has been born who will live to 150. What, it, could you give us any kind of quantification whether that fact is correct and what the limits are on human longevity? Uh, yes, uh, that fact is correct. Uh, I myself is planning to live at least 120 years. Jean Clement, uh, who died back in 1997 in Paris, she died uh, at the age of 122 years and six months. Uh, I <clears throat> you know, made a prize, it will be birthday gift for the first person who will celebrate uh, hers or his uh, 123rd birthday. Now, <clears throat> uh, here's the logic. If uh, that woman uh, would live now, uh, because of the significant progress in the actual practical biomedicine uh, during the last 23 years since uh, her death, apparently she would uh, live longer than 122, so maybe 125, potentially maybe even 130. So apparently she had, you know, genetic predisposition for super uh, long living. But at the same time, uh, back in 1997, there were not yet so much advanced technologies as, as they are now. On the other hand, uh, <laughs> there is such term in life extension. Uh, actually, it's also in air space. Um, life extension, uh, there is term uh, escape velocity. And the point is that uh, progress is accelerating so at some certain point of time, by our estimation, it will be 2030, uh, the speed of the progress in biomedicine will be so significant that if any person will live one, if will survive, he will you know, succeed to survive one additional year, uh, that person will uh, get access to so much uh, more 
uh, technologies that it will give possibility to, li to live another year. So that, that will be so-called escape velocity. But to, to go to be more specific for people uh, of average um, age around 30, 40, especially 20 years, you know, people with good immunity currently without significant um, pathologies. So that for them, access to that uh, so-called escape velocity it is uh, even uh, more. So in, in other words, people who are now 25, 30 years, most likely they will be capable to live up to 150 years. People who are now 90 years old, because they already accumulated a lot of you know different issues with health, maybe their life expectancy will be 100, 110, 120 on average. So to summarize, uh, uh, the more the progress, uh, the more this, uh, you know, um, forecasting that the younger people uh, life extensions will uh, be more and more. By the way, for example, Jack Ma of Alibaba, uh, he's predicting that people will live 200 years. Fantastic. And I believe I might be right in saying that to have escape velocity and astrophysics mentioned um, to this extent may be a first for GAP Summit. So I'm really pleased with that. Um, one of the themes that's come up here is the availability of big data, um, new technologies for storing big data, such as DNA storage. Um, I wonder if you could please, um, addressing this to the floor, um, um, and Dimitri Matthias, maybe um, because this was touched on in your talk, could you tell us how we can actually integrate and understand and use that available data? I mean, I can make one comment, Dimitri, um, and, and, and please comment from, from your perspective. So. So I, I would actually start with Dimitri and maybe then reiterate because he said uh, escape velocity biomedicine progress. I would then next start the question, um, what is hindering us or where are the rate limiting steps at this moment of time? And yes, we can do cheaper, faster trials, all the good things, but I would argue the rate limiting step perhaps sits in disease understanding or, or biology understanding, let's say of healthy processes or disease processes. If that's true, if that's true, we talk about biology. So far, we have often used reductionist approaches, the one assay for one disease, the one drug, and then we hope for cure. We all know that biology is complex. Hence, we need AI. So to understand it, that, however, requires rich data sets. So it's a necessity. If that necessity is true, the technologies that are developing in parallel are actually a must have meaning uh, data storage, data, data management, analytics. So I would make that long circle. Sorry for the long circle, but that drives the requirement. And I think in, in sympathy for the, for the engineers, for the data, I mean, I mean, the progress in that dimension is so vast. I mean, one example I keep on using since the year 2000, when the uh, human genome draft was published, we have the cost of storing one genome is roughly 5,000 fold cheaper today and will be another thousand fold in, in a few, few years even. And that fuels innovation on the biomedical side. So that's maybe one storyline, but uh, Dimitri, I saw you nodding, but maybe you have, I mean, have some additions. Uh, first of all, I totally agree about, uh, you know, big data about artificial intelligence and more of it. Uh, currently, you know, in the last several years, the most, um, let's say, most progressive uh, frontier of medicine was so-called uh, precision medicine, personalized precision medicine. Now, in reality, if we're talking about longevity, uh, we shall focus on precision health. So it's much more advanced compared to uh, precision medicine. To maintain state of precision health, there are required much more uh, advanced technologies, much more advanced science, and uh, much more advanced personalized science being applied to one particular person. And uh, the science yet is not so much advanced to understand what does mean real health, what does mean precision health, how to maintain it in a very precision, precise uh, way. The only one real tool uh, to make it done and to make it done in not in, you know, 10 or 20 years, but uh, two, three, five years, it's uh, data science and artificial intelligence being applied to particular uh, person and uh, <clears throat> artificial intelligence shall be applied particularly uh, on the matter of biomarkers of healthy longevity. And now there is a lot of scientists working on identifying uh, biomarkers of longevity, uh, but uh, this is an uh, extremely challenging field of science, the very, very uh, frontier of aging research. And uh, the only one way how to monitor, uh, you know, detect, um, uh, assess uh, what is currently going in the body of a particular person and uh, how to uh, 
enhance proceed with state of uh, precision health the only one uh, tool it will be artificial intelligence it's beyond uh, you know capabilities of uh, human scientists thank you very much and i wonder if i could just ask a question to sarah it's just like clarification um about the calculation of the impact of the food on climate change um, one of our lats wonders does that calculation account for differing production in different areas of the world yeah so that, i mean the, the best question that i get asked about some of those numbers that, are, that are, i've shown is is that surely there is not just one number and that's absolutely right and so yes it completely does depend on the, the practice that it's done on the farm um, and you know and, and on the along the food supply supply chain and so the numbers that i was showing were mostly averages for europe um, but the numbers do vary depending on where you're getting. For example, in the case of beef, uh, which is the number that a lot of people are most interested in, um, then the numbers that are in the literature at the moment um, uh, are, are larger for Latin America um, because deforestation is included in the effective uh, impact on the climate. So um, depending on how you count deforestation and, and when that occurred, then, then that, that can give different numbers. So that's an example of how those numbers do vary around the world, but also it depends on um, the efficiency of the and how, how long the animals live. Uh, in the case of ruminants, uh, which are burping methane, they're, they're, they're converting about 5% of the calories uh, that they eat into methane and burping that out. So, um, you know, it depends how long they live as to how many days they're, they're, they're doing that for. So that, that's, and there's a big variation around the world in that as well, for example. And some of the questions that we've got here are moving towards um, questions about science in the context of society i suppose um one of them being that in the context we're currently in we've seen that government and industry can suddenly respond to a crisis um why even now has such a long term such a significant crisis as the climate crisis not had the same tangible institutional effort and i'll put that to the floor I think if I knew the answer to that, I'd be, uh, yeah, I think we're all wondering that, aren't we? So, um, no, I mean, I, I, I guess uh, just, I'm not, I've not studied this, but uh, anecdotally, my, my impression is that obviously, you know, when a crisis, the timeline of a crisis lasts longer than the uh, democratic uh, election cycle in a democracy, then, then you have a problem. Um, I don't think I've got anything more profound to say than that. Maybe I can ask Dimitri in terms of the, um, the, the, the visions or the ambitions that drive the investment. Um, is there a distinction between um, the, return of, uh, the return on capital and the goals achieved or can they ever be aligned? Um, well, for example, if we are talking about like, investing in this field of longevity, uh, the only one way how to generate profit in that field is to actually deliver health to people. Uh, it's uh, quite different, you know, compared to pharma industry. In case of pharma corporations, uh, it's a question whether, you know, health longevity is uh, beneficial for sustainable business model of pharma corporations. Whereas in case of longevity corporations, if, if you have full name that way, the only one uh, way how to satisfy people to actually deliver health. And this is a very ethical, you know, side of the business. So that is why in case of... Uh, uh, longevity business. Uh, it's uh, the best possible business because it's delivering uh, the most pressured asset uh, to the people, the most valuable asset, health. And Matthias, I wonder from the um, research um, that's shown that you've done within the bio revolution, if you could speak to the uptake amongst institutions, amongst governments, um, what's drive that, what has driven that so far and what our LOTs could do to drive that further? Um. So um, I think there's definitely an interest in the bioscience, obviously. And um, I mean, I, I have to take a little a slight turn to, to, to be able to answer it because uh, well, the typical question we rather get, who is leading in this area? So the inverse kind of of this question. I mean, because right now across the planet, I mean, I think we, we have a slightly polarizing world and particular at this intersection of biology and particular AI, I think in terms of investment levels, in terms of progress, I think particularly um, um, the US and China um, turn out to be at, at the front row. 
at the same time as a European, I, I mean, I'm biased for the Europeans, the scientific quality and the foundation sits also in, in Europe. So the question is a little bit how this movie is playing out. I think everyone feels incentivized to, to invest into um, the basic science. And that's why I mentioned basically US, Europe, China, but also many smaller companies think about bioeconomies and the role of bio, et cetera. However, what is very different by area areas, how to uh, unleash it, how to scale it. And that's, I think, where the differentiation is made. And there, uh, I would acknowledge, for instance, a weakness in Europe. We have a lot of great science, but the scaling and translating it into impact for humans and with that small step in between through commercial approaches, commercial businesses, is a little bit the problem. So I would say interest is not the problem. I think long-term investment is for some the problem and creating the right environment from basic science all the way to, let me call it impact, because I'm not after revenues and profits. It's how do you reach larger populations with a great scientific idea? Okay, thank you. And I've got two questions here, which I think are very similar, and I will combine them into one. The first is, is there a tension or is there a compatibility between themes which have come up in all of your talks in terms of a drive towards precision care, but also global challenges? And, um, and related to that is how can we balance investment between pushing boundaries and frontiers of biotech, but then also meeting many basic global needs? Difficult questions. Uh, I don't know any appetite, Robert. Maybe let, let me just maybe pick one small element of the last one: how to guide investment. That's that, that's. I mean, I'm I'm really I, I don't I don't believe I have an answer, but I mean I'm struck by that problem, and I would say the current pandemic crisis shows us something: we can mobilize. Yeah, and I take the example of the biomedical pharmaceutical field. We can certainly uh, mobilize. We can certainly collaborate. Still, we have a lot of resources running in parallel. And maybe, I guess, probably we need lots of shots on goals. Now, at the same time, I think it took take as many years and perhaps more years to recognize the big challenges, let's say climate sustainability, Sarah talked about. I think we need a similar recognition and, and sign of urgency that we can really mobilize properly against it. Because, um, I mean, my favorite example, and then I stop this usually, yes, we are very concerned about COVID and rightly so, obviously. However, every cancer patient deserves the same urgency. Or every, I could have picked any other disease. Yeah? And so the question, there is something around how do we create that urgency and mobilization, which I don't have a great answer for, but I don't know, Sarah and Dimitri, how you feel about it. Uh, maybe I will answer, you know, from the angle of longevity. There is again uh, such myth that uh, life extension will be affordable only for super rich people, whereas uh, poor people, you know, will uh, will have very limited access to even basic biomedicine. In reality, this is not the point. Uh, because of uh, data science, because of big data analysis, because of artificial intelligence, because of uh, digital medicine, M Health, you know, uh, medicine through mobile apps. Even age tech, uh, a specific application for older people who are not even uh, digitally sophisticated, but now uh, having access to so-called age tech mobile applications, very simple, user-friendly. All people can get access to quite a lot of you know uh, new technologies, uh, very sophisticated. At the same time, delivered to them uh, via simple applications, and <clears throat> and uh, indeed, super wealthy people they will have access to very advanced technology, but at the same time, their investments, their spendings on additional R&D uh, will help also to distribute uh, um, modernize and accelerate progress also with uh, low uh, tech technologies affordable for people on average, young, old, and you know, people who do not have currently access to advanced biomedicine because maybe they are in some uh, developing countries, so, you know, with uh, low infrastructure, maybe in, in Africa. But once again, because of Overall progress, uh, the distribution, especially via uh, AMP Health, is actually accelerating. So th that's why this inequality in access to advanced biomedicine with years it will decrease. So that gap uh, will, you know, it will um, it will become uh, less an issue in the next five to ten years. 
I mean, I, I, I guess I, I see that there's a contrast in scale between global challenges and, and precision solutions, but I don't personally find that a, a dichotomy. You know, I don't feel there's a tension between those two things. I think you can still, you know, if we if we have um, accountability and metrics which are um, aimed at solving the global challenges, for example, um, carbon, you know, greenhouse gases per country. Um, preferably what's 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 caused by that country rather than what's produced by that country and that's a say a, a metric which feeds into a global uh, accounting but then that can then drive change uh, right down into detailed precision uh, precision agriculture is one example where you know that's a that's a that's a solution which helps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on a field where you're actually giving each square meter the nutrients it needs so so sometimes those global metrics can actually drive precision solutions and, and I don't personally find that's a that's a, a tension okay thank you very much and so we're just coming towards the end of our time now um as a final question which i'd like to ask all of you please and i we'll probably have about 20 seconds um, 30 seconds for each of you to address this looking at the long term of our careers of our leaders of tomorrow predicting the future which is in the small print of being part of this panel what advice would you give on the gaps that they need to address um, also for their individual development, but also those collaborative opportunities given the cross-cutting nature of a biotechnology future. And we'll start with um, Matthias, please. 20 seconds, oh my God, but let me try. Um, I think look positive into the future. Innovation is there to tackle the challenges. Embrace breadth of disciplines and think across your disciplines. If there was one learning I took away it's across biotech, high tech. I mean, um, rocket science, Sarah. I mean, you. I mean, I mean, many, many other disciplines. But think cross disciplinary, and I think engage with society in this debate. I think that's what I would say. And good luck for all of us. I agree with uh, Matthias, and um, I myself, and um, I'm techno optimist, and do believe that uh, technology will bring you know um, positive impact on global. A scale on um, for all humanity. At the same time, uh, for people who are now, you know, in uh, biomedicine, biotech industry, I think that artificial intelligence it will be the major uh, key uh, tool uh, and leverage solution for to optimize uh, further development of multiple other practical applications. Yeah, I, mean, I, I definitely agree with this, um, the, the, the interdisciplinary uh, nature that we really, you know, most global problems now are, are, are many faceted, very interdisciplinary problems. And I think a, a sort of a trap that a lot of people fall into is to sort of look for the next step always in a field of research. But it's much better, I think, to come at that saying, what, what's the big global problem that I, or what's the big problem that I want to solve? And then pull together whatever disciplines you need to try and solve that problem. And don't be afraid to ask big questions questions rather than just always the next step in a field of research. I think I've definitely learned that over the last few years. Well, unfortunately, there are so many more things to say, and that is all the time that we have today. But thank you so much. In a short panel, we've covered what we can do, potentially what we should do, and some details about how we might achieve it. So for Professor Sarah Bridal, Dr. Matthias Evers, and Dimitri Kaminsky, thank you so much for your time.